So today we're talking about John Locke, and we're starting with his discussion of why he thinks innate ideas don't exist. <clears throat> so just to remind you, there's the rationalist view that we've been talking about. Descartes was uh, one example of a rationalist, and rationalists believe that there are some beliefs that we don't need to appeal uh, to any experience to justify. Right? Experience can be left to the side. We can justify these beliefs in another way. One of those popular ways, one of the most popular ways for rationalists to have such uh, justifications for their ideas is to say these ideas are innate. So they're justified, we know that they're true, and we can believe in them because they're innate within us, we've always had them, uh, or God encoded us with them at the beginning, however you want to say it. Right? First, there's some explanation as to why everybody has this idea already when they come into existence. Okay, so it's justified because we've always had it, uh, and Locke's going to say, well, if you could prove this, it would be good evidence for the rationalist view, but there's good reason to believe that innate ideas do not exist. And so if Locke's successful in sort of showing that innate ideas don't exist, then he's given us uh, or gotten rid of one of the reasons for believing in rationalism, and then he would advance the empiricist view, and John Locke is an empiricist. So why believe innate ideas don't exist? Well, he starts off not really with an argument as to why they don't exist, but just some reason why we should be cautious of them in the first place. So he thinks innate ideas are a dangerous thing. So think about how this concept of innate ideas could be abused politically. So it would allow rulers or a ruling class to make a lot of claims about what they're justified in doing. A skillful ruler or a, uh, ev an evil ruler even could make a bunch of claims about uh, how some members of the community are more valuable than others. And then let's say we just take the wealthy class for a second. So the ruler says, hey, the wealthy class is more valuable than the poor class. And so the wealthy class gets more political power. And then the poor class says, well, how are you going to justify such a clearly unfair policy? And the ruling class, okay, look, it's innate. Like, if you just had the time and energy like I do as the ruler, you would be able to inspect your own ideas and see the truth of the value of the wealthy class. All right, so it would allow people to claim a lot of things are innate. Uh, and then they could use those for bad purposes, and there'd be it would be very difficult to prove them wrong, right? And so given the unfair power advantage and the unfair educational advantage normally held by the ruling or wealthy class, they would get uh, political advantage off of just claiming things are innate ideas instead of proving their innate ideas. And so it would take away sort of the input of the reason uh, input of reason from the masses, right? So if you have the masses up in arms about a particular policy and they start providing reasons as to why they think the policy should be different, the ruling class can say, look, you just don't understand or don't have a full grasp of what the innate ideas really are. The true innate idea is a difference in power, so on and so forth. So hopefully you can see now why such innate ideas could be dangerous politically. And then you could use this in other fields too, but Locke was mostly worried about the political field. Okay, so then why should we actually think, besides just innate ideas are dangerous, why should we think that innate ideas do not exist? And Locke's going to say, well, it's mostly because rational arguments trying to prove the existence of innate ideas all fail. So one very common argument for the existence of innate ideas is that they're universally accepted. And the best explanation for such ideas being universally accepted is that they're innate. So think about that for a second. Rationalists are saying, 
look, it's pretty miraculous that literally everybody has these ideas. Think about all the things we generally disagree about and see how widespread our disagreement is on all of these issues. Right? So if the rationalist is right that these ideas are universally accepted, that would be pretty miraculous. That couldn't just happen by accident. There has to be a better explanation for it. And one really simple explanation is that all of these ideas are innate ideas. So the second we were all born, we came into the world with these ideas or something similar to that. And that would explain exactly why we all have these ideas or why they're universally accepted. So that's the general argument that some rationalists give. Look, the, these ideas are universally accepted, and the easiest way to make sense of that is to say that the ideas are innate. Now Locke's going to say this argument ultimately fails for two major reasons. First, Locke thinks these ideas just aren't universally accepted. And he brings up the example of children or uh, tribesmen who've had little contact with the rest of the, the world. And he says, look, what's an example of a, an innate idea? And some rationalists will say some difficult principle. Some will just say something simple, like 2 plus 2 equals 4, the truths of mathematics, right? truths of geometry, truths of simple arithmetic. These things are innate ideas. We all come into the world just being able to ascertain the truth of 2 plus 2 equals 4. But then Locke says, look, ask a baby fresh out of the womb what 2 plus 2 equals 4 is. It won't be able to respond. Ask a child the second it gains the ability to speak what is 2 plus 2 equal? Chances are they're not going to be able to tell you, right? Or they're going to have, uh, have, you, have a need for you to explain more. But if these ideas were really innate, then we shouldn't have to explain anything else to the children, right? The second we say 2 plus 2 equals 4, they should be able to access that innate knowledge that they have and tell us, okay, if you say 2 plus 2, I know the answer is 4. Right? But children don't have this ability. We have to actually teach them that these uh, statements or problems are true. And he thinks the same is true of many tribesmen. If you go and take any of the rationalist principles and you say, hey, tribesmen, please explain this principle to me, they won't be able to do it. And that's proof that they don't universally accept this idea. They might not have even heard of it before. But if these ideas were really innate, we wouldn't need them to hear of it, right? They should just already have it. So children and tribesmen are good examples of uh, groups of people who are uh, good, clear evidence that not everybody accepts these ideas, that some of these people need to be taught them that they're not innate. Okay, and the second reason that he thinks the universal acceptance argument fails is that even if these ideas were universally accepted, there could be another explanation for it. So here's one possibility. Everybody accepts the idea that 2 plus 2 equals 4, not because it's an innate idea, but because our brains are set up to organize experiences in a specific way. So just to keep with this example of 2 plus 2 equals 4, uh, we can say that our brains are just sort of set up to organize number. Right? So if we see objects laid out in front of us, we know our brain will instantly start to group them put them together, pull them apart, and putting them together is the process of addition, right? So the brain is able to organize things in terms of addition already. And so, although now we need to be told how to classify each grouping, right? We have to be told that when you have two objects put together, the word you use is two. And when you have all four set up, the word you use is four. But our brain was just set up to organize these things, and so once we know the words, to describe what we're seeing, we can all do this. Right? So just because they're universally accepted doesn't mean they have to be innate. There are other explanations, such as our brain organization possibility, uh, and there's probably many more. Right? And so Locke's going to say, you can't just pick the one option you like. You have to prove which is actually true or the most likely, and you haven't done that yet because you haven't even sort of engaged with these other options. You just said, oh, innate ideas is the only way. 
Okay, so that's two reasons why the universal acceptance argument fails. So besides innate ideas being dangerous and their major argument for innate ideas failing, he wants to say one more thing about innate ideas. Locke thinks he has a superior alternative. So he thought that his empiricism, he's going to give us this big robust theory of empiricism, and he's going to say, look, once you use my theory, you won't need innate ideas anymore. Right, so here's roughly what he has in mind. If we can explain everything we need to explain without appealing to this weird notion of innate ideas, then why would we postulate the existence of such a weird extra thing? And so this is a very scientific principle Locke is using here. Right? So in science, uh, it's generally accepted that if you can explain something with fewer um, fewer assumptions, right? if you can explain something with fewer objects or fewer assumptions, then that simpler explanation is the better explanation. So if you can explain why the electricity turns on and off when you flip a switch in your house, uh, just by describing the actual uh, mechanics of the switch and the wiring and so on, well, then there's no extra reason to then postulate these, uh, let's say, wall gnomes, right? And so every time you flip the switch, these wall gnomes are running around in your wall, uh, carrying bits of electricity, moving the wires around to turn lights on in your house. Right? Which explanation is simpler? The original, with just using the mechanics. There's no need to postulate the existence of these extra weird little wall gnomes, right? We don't need to uh, bring in these extra entities. We can explain everything with fewer entities. So why wouldn't we do that? And so that's what Locke's sort of saying here. Right? Uh, if you're going to be a rationalist, you explain everything, and then you also have to appeal to this weird concept of innate ideas. If you're an empiricist like Locke, you can explain everything without needing these weird innate ideas. So the empiricist theory is supposed to be a better alternative. And so just to summarize before we conclude, Locke thought that uh, we need to get rid of this rationalist concept of innate ideas. One, because the concept of innate ideas can be dangerous politically. Two, because all of the rationalist arguments for innate ideas fail, particularly the argument from universal acceptance. And finally, the empiricist alternative is superior because it doesn't need to postulate these extra weird things. All right, so uh, now that he's given us good reason to think that innate ideas don't exist, we need to look at what his superior alternative actually is. And so we'll begin looking at his empiricism in the next video.